think really at the intersection of education and employment, trying to surface new solutions as we think about new challenges in the 21st century. And it's actually timely because you just announced um, your launch new research today around underemployment, where gender comes up quite a bit as far as um, we look at the impacts of underemployment, women are disproportionately affected. So maybe you could speak to that before we get going. I would love to hand it over to you. And Thanks so much for coming, everyone. Um, for being with us. And thank you everyone for being here. I know it was short notice and I appreciate the excited joining um, us on this early morning. Yes, yeah, so uh, as Jenna mentioned, and we've actually had a chance to read our report as well, we just released um, uh, a report today leveraging Learning Last data. We partnered with them to take a closer look at underemployment. Uh, generally, when we sort of think about this you know, this term that, that gets at this idea of people being overqualified for the jobs that they are in, uh, we tend to sort of uh, think about it as a short-term problem. When we think about newly minted grads working as baristas at Starbucks or working at Target, we kind of think, okay, well, that it's a short-term problem, they'll find their footing maybe in a year, and then they'll start their career. That kind of drift is just sort of a right passage. But what was startling is we actually did an analysis of 4 million unique resumes. And out of those, and we did it longitudinally over 10 years. And what we found is for the folks who actually started out underemployed in their first job, and it's important to note that not everyone starts out underemployed. There are, there, there are folks who are able to escape the trap of underemployment. But for the people who actually start off underemployed, which in this analysis is about 43%, if you start out underemployed, you're five times more likely to remain underemployed five years out. And 75% of that population actually remains underemployed 10 years out. And for women, the odds are actually much worse. So out of the total scan, we saw that 37% of men sort of ran the risk of being underemployed versus 47% of women. So basically, one out of three men faced the potential of underemployment, whereas one out of two women uh, were facing those, uh, were just facing worse odds. And, and we're not exactly sure why, right? If you can't, the analysis doesn't yet go into that, but what we can kind of get at is, is it a lack of access to social capital networks, right? Is it, is it um, somehow that there's, a, there's an inability to kind of access those same old boys networks or, um, uh, or sorry, the old boys clubs? And we don't know, but it kind of, it kind of connects quite um, nicely with the systems issues that you talk about, right? It's not just that, there are certain kind of bad fish. You're talking about like the bad girl <laughs> problem in Silicon Valley. And you talk about these kind of institutional injustices and violations against women. And I'm thinking, you know, this is all, I know you didn't time it this way, but it was very timely kind of with the news. And um, Tarana Burr, who kind of was responsible for this, started this about 10 years ago, she was saying that when the Me Too hashtag watched, 12 million women you know, came onto Twitter and said, me too, within 24 hours. Right? And she said that in any other case, if that had been some sort of communicable disease, we would have been searching desperately for a cure. Right? And so I'm wondering, um, you know, as, as we think about just the way you begin uh, this book, talking about Lena, the Swedish Playboy model, right, as kind of that first image of the internet, you know, was this, Sort of tech industry kind of thing to begin with. Yeah, so before we get to Lena, I want to go back even earlier. Um, the, the history of how we got here actually to me was the smoking gun. Um, and, you know, when I went back to the 40s and 50s, I realized that women actually played a huge role in the computing industry. They were programming computers for the military and programming computers for NASA. And it literally was like hidden figures, the movie, but industry wide. And then in the 60s and 70s, as the tech industry was starting to explode, um, they were so desperate for new talent that they started doing these personality tests and aptitude tests to identify who would make a good programmer. And they decided that good programmers, quote, don't like people. <laughs> well, if you look for people who don't like people, you'll hire far more men than women. <laughs> That's what the research tells us. I appreciate, I appreciate the chuckles. Um, um, but there's also no research to support this idea that people who don't like people are better at this job than people who do. In fact, there's a, a great argument to be made that we need people with empathy. 
empathy, um, you know, doing these very important jobs and solving these important problems for, for um, you know, billions of people around the world, but also there's no evidence to support that men are better at this job than women. But these tests were widely held for decades and perpetuated this idea of the antisocial, mostly white male nurse stereotype that persists to this day. And so in 1984, women hit the high point of earning degrees in computer science, 37%. That has since plummeted to 18%, where it's been flat for the last decade. And you see about the same trend with jobs. So I argue in the book that the tech industry created a pipeline problem. Yes, there is a pipeline problem today, but the tech industry reinforces it in so many ways, 300 pages of voice. Um, that said, it wasn't malicious, it wasn't intentional, it was almost like a series of accidents that stacked up on top of each other and led to this very, very big, and you know, I would say, you know, world, you know, huge problem that we have today, where you know, 95% of the decisions made in the industry that's building the future are made by men. Um, but Lena is a perfect example of one of those accidents. Um, and if, you know, for those of you who don't know the story, in in, in 1973 at a computer lab at USC. They were developing the first image processing algorithms which led to the JPEG. And all men in this lab, and they were looking for a good photo to test their algorithms. And it just so happened that a Playboy magazine was lying around because that was normal and someone was enjoying it. And yeah, nobody thought this was unusual. Um, and I actually tracked down the head researcher who told me, told me how it happened it was like, actually, I'm the one that said there's some pretty nice photos in there. And they're glossy and full of texture and detail. They're just good photos. <laughs> and so they happened to use that photo to test the algorithm. And it went on to become the most popular photo used in figure algorithm processing to this day. So if you worked on the Apple iPhone camera or Google Images, you've seen this photo. Um, and it's not, so it's actually, it's a photo from the centerfold. It's just her sort of looking over her shoulder. The rest of it is cropped out. But for men, it's kind of this amazing historical sort of footnote. And I had a few engineers say to me, oh my god, I have no idea. She was naked. Um, whereas for women who actually saw this photo in their computer science classes, it was very alienating. Um, and when I asked this researcher, he's now, he, he works at Stanford. He, he does, you know, cats, reads cat scans pro bono. Um, you know, are you aware of the controversy around this photo? Like, don't you think it's a little alienating for women? And he said, well, it wasn't sexist at all. There were just no women in the classroom at the time. So it's like, it's not our fault. And it was sort of the beginning of this like half century of passing the buck of people saying, it's not my problem. I just create this problem. It just, it just is. Um, but in fact, it wasn't always this way. And it also doesn't have to be this way. But we have to understand what happened in order to make it. Yeah. It's interesting, this whole centerfold cropping of the model, it reminds me of um, what Kodak did with the Shirley Card study, where um, they were trying to calibrate photos and they had this white woman, kind of a similar sort of uh, something kind of hanging off her shoulder. It was a white woman and they had a couple of different colors to sort of just calibrate color in printing. But then what they realized is that black skin, brown skin, yellow skin just did not work with that Shirley Card. And they realized that, that this Seemingly innocuous thing was actually really harmful, yeah. or, or and they call it normal. This is normalizing, right? Photos. If you go back to the USC library of like dozens and dozens of digital images, you know, there's photos of bell peppers and <laughs> monkeys and like twelve different photos just called girl of all different girls, just in different yeah. suggestive positions. <laughs> but this is this um uh, this interesting thing that you talk about, which happened much earlier on where women were basically getting profiled out of engineering programs. It's really interesting today because now you see a lot of educational institutions trying to entice women and minorities into STEM fields because they have been needed out through this process. And so there's a different approach and there's these sort of brand challenges and other programs that are trying to create real world problems for people to solve to entice them into an engineering program without you know starting them on a calculus. It's, it's amazing how much we can now backtrack from something that was actually where the women were sort of dominating in that, in that sort of computer industry. Um, 
But I was wondering, so another thing that kind of relates um, to our two pieces of work where um, in this underemployment uh, gender gap that we're seeing, what's interesting is for men, um, if you actually major in, in a STEM field, like computer science and engineering, or even communications, communication, communications interestingly kind of helps you kind of stay out of the trap of underemployment. Um, but for women, it doesn't matter if you're a STEM major, pretty much. And uh, you will still have that sort of higher rate of underemployment, except for the case of engineering, where you are equally likely to be underemployed as a man. And you talk about the minus list of PC uh, venture capitalists and how 60% of them, only 60% maybe, have some sort of STEM background, whereas the vast majority of women have a STEM background, right? Can you kind of talk a little bit about this? Yeah, so the spark that lit the fire that got me to write the book was I was sitting down with one of the most prominent venture capitalists in Silicon Valley who invested in Google, made a lot of money. Um, they had no women in their firm at the time. And I said, you know, I sort of become accustomed to asking these questions of my guests. Um, and I said, what are you doing about that? What do you think hire more women? And what do you think your responsibility is? And he said, oh looking very hard for women, not enough of them are studying STEM, and also we're not prepared to lower our standards. This is on television. <laughs> um, and everywhere I went for the next three months, people wanted to talk about what I had said. I mean, it was just like shock and horror. Um, and there was a Vanity Fair headline that said, here's news to all you smart, talented women who want to work in technology. Apparently, you don't exist. Um, and you know, one of the, the, the fallouts of, of that interview is, is, is we basically pulled apart the minus list and looked at basically the standards for the men and the women on the minus list. And we found that the men on the minus list don't have STEM degrees and the women do. <laughs> so the standards are you know, different yeah. for men and women, which I mean, I think is, is, a, is a broader theme. And you know, if you don't know the numbers, women have 25% of jobs across the industry. Women account for seven to 8% of venture capital investors. And women-led companies get 2% of funding. In an industry that calls itself meritocracy, mm -hmm. I, I, I know that women don't have just 2% of good ideas, because we really have like 95% of good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the, the standards are completely different. And if you, it, it, it's not only how you choose programmers, as we discussed, but how you choose investors, also how you choose entrepreneurs. And so, Qualities that are seen as positive in men are seen as negative in women. Um, so for a male entrepreneur who's pitching a business, if he's young, investors see that as high potential. If a woman is young, they see that as an experience. If a man is you know, relatively cautious, they think, oh, that's interesting, kind of unique. For a woman, that's a complete red flag. Oh, she can't do this. And so when investors are looking to fund a male entrepreneur, they're doing this simple sort of risk benefit. Calculation, do we like the idea? Can this person execute? And when they're looking to fund a woman, it's this whole big thing. Like, does she have what it takes to start um, a world changing company? And the problem is that, that, you know, these words like visionary and genius, we don't use those words to describe women. And yet we use them to describe dozens and dozens and dozens of men. Um, and that's something that really needs to change. Yeah, you have this wonderful quote from Tom Powell. From who's who sort of led that infamous suit against Kleiner Perkins? It's the whole thing. Kleiner Perkins fought the fire. They're trying to rebrand. <laughs> they only want to be Kleiner now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, this, this idea of scale is really interesting because she kind of talks about it where, you know, if we talk about how some of these companies kind of get to a size of about 50 before they realize, oh my gosh, we have all men here in our company. And then we try to kind of backtrack and, and, and fill in. Um, and, it, and scale is so prized in, in venture capital back enterprises, right? We're always talking about scale. Is this scale? Mm -hmm. And she says, it is very difficult to change a community once it has gone in a certain direction. But I hope other internet companies realize it is when you have problems, they scale with your company. Then it becomes very hard to revise the approach you have taken once the genie is out of the bottle. So can you talk a little bit about why it's so important? Like, I think you're very optimistic in the sense that it's not too late. Right, but how do we prevent this kind of from sort of scaling into a much, much bigger problem? Right. Um, so, 
part of the reason I share Ellen's story is because we talk a little bit about what she did when she was at Reddit trying to crack down on online harassment and trolling, which, 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 which we could consider one of the biggest problems in the world today. Um, and um, I interviewed Ed Williams, who's the co-founder of Twitter, who told me he thinks that if women were on the early Twitter team, that maybe online harassment and trolling wouldn't be such a problem today. He was like, we weren't thinking about this, but we were building Twitter. We were thinking about wonderful and amazing things that could be done with it, not how it could send death threats or rape threats. Um, and I found this amazing article from the New York Times in 1984, which talked about the rise of this thing called electronic communication. And suddenly, people were saying things to each other over electronic mail that they would never say to your face. And it basically sort of you know, it solidified this idea that you know, humans aren't just mean. Um, you know, and in, in normal human interaction, you wouldn't use some of the language that you use over email. Um, but it's the way that the systems are designed that, in fact, encourages certain kinds of behavior. And so had Twitter been designed differently, or had Reddit been designed differently, then I have no doubt that, if they had been thinking of these things, then I have no doubt that um, actually people might be a little bit friendlier. Um, and so it sort of led me to this idea of, well, what if women had had a seat at the table 30 years ago? You know, how could the world be different? Would harassment be such a problem? Would porn be so ubiquitous? Would video games be so violent? Would we have better parental controls on things like this? Um, facial recognition technology is already a little bit sexist and a little bit racist, and it doesn't recognize women and people of color the same way. I actually had a female investor say to me, I really think you should look into this. Face ID just doesn't work for me, and it works for my husband, and I swear to God, like, half the time it's like, who are you? And I'm like, this is my phone, I can't even open it. Um, and so, there are so many things, I, I am optimistic, believe it or not. Um, there are so many things that companies can do and so many things that individuals can do. And the last chapter of the book really dives into sort of solutions. Um, but I do think the number one thing is, is change needs to come from the top. And we need you know, CEOs and investors who make this a top priority. And it's even better if they really believe it should be a priority. But you know, there's a plethora of research, and I'm sure you in this room have, have heard about it, that shows that diverse teams have better results, more innovative, make more money, but that kind of lies over, over people's heads. Um, but I make plenty of arguments in the book that this isn't just the right thing to do, which I believe it is. This is the smart thing to do. Um, and actually I sort of tell the story of Google and how you know, they early of Google, they hired all of these talented women, and Google is this incredible success, and we sort of think, oh, they were just like the most innovative first to future, when in fact they actually put a lot of effort into building a diverse team, and then they sort of lost focus, which is another story. Um, but I look at a company called Slack, where the CEO has made this an explicit priority. And he didn't do it until there were about 50 people. And they were already, you know, almost 50, almost all men. Um, and, you know, he just decided, like, this is really important. I want to make this a thing. And so they you know, diversified their recruiting heads. They started sourcing people <coughs> represented schools. They changed their jobs to certain they standardized their interview process. They, um, you know, standardized their review and feedback systems. Because it's not only about hiring, it's about keeping the women that you, and underrepresented minorities that you already have in the organization. Um, women are <coughs> twice as likely to quit tech as men, and 800% more likely to leave a job in tech than other uh, women in other jobs in other fields, and they're not leaving to take care of their families. And this goes to your, your underemployment point earlier. Um, they're leaving for jobs in other fields. And so there's this perception that women just, you know, they, they lean back mid-career, they don't want to be there, but actually the reasons they say that they are leaving are they don't feel valued, they don't know if they're progressing, they, they don't know if they're going to be promoted, hostile environment, feelings of isolation, which are actually reasons that men leave jobs too. Um, and so there's so much to be done to create sort of inclusive environments that support people over the course of a long career. And so Slack, for example, is not trying to create this polished or fantasy land that you know Facebook and Google really started out as. They're looking for grown-ups. Mm -hmm. And their motto is work hard and go home. Yeah. There's no ping pong tables, there's no dinner on demand. Um, and they're actually punching way above the averages. So they've got 43% women at the company, 48% uh, of managers are women, 
and something like 37 percent of women in the prime technical roles um, which just goes to show like if you care you can do this um i wrote an op-ed in, in business week a couple weeks ago where i said amazon is looking for this new headquarters they narrowed it down to 10 cities they're going to be starting from scratch creating 50,000 jobs there's no reason those jobs can't be 50 50 men and women and represent people of color, at least in line with the local population. And if Jeff Bezos can, you know, you know, create a, you know, the, the bookstore for the world and send rockets into space and buy grocery stores and, you know, build these speakers that can talk to us in our kitchens, like, surely he can hire more women and pay them fairly. Right. I, I just, I don't think this is too hard for us to do. Yeah. I think Jeff runs Alibaba is so Alibaba is a very interesting case, and you're right um, that they've actually made some pretty good progress. They have a really strong, um, they a really diverse leadership team, and Jack Ma made it a priority. Yeah, it was him. Yeah, it, it really was. His concept was around love, right? Like, love for customers. Love and karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, I, I do think we are at like a really interesting inflection point, right? Where Especially as you get these forecasts about artificial intelligence and you know the sort of deep and machine learning, we're starting to talk about algorithms, right? And the bias embedded in this algorithm. So it was interesting. Kristen and I were at a, at a meeting with a bunch of artificial intelligence experts from UK and from Harvard and MIT, and there was this kind of same sort of innocuous, like we didn't know that this was going to happen. We didn't know. We didn't really foresee that deep learning would be so sophisticated. Powerful, and so now it's kind of this reactive. Like we need to, we need to figure out how to how to make sure that the biases are not, you know, getting inflated in, in, a, in a crazy way. And so I think I think we are at this really critical inflection point where we, we do need to be intentional and deliberate. Like absolutely. Well, you know, I mentioned facial recognition technology, and I, I interviewed this this researcher at Microsoft who wrote this amazing paper about how, you know, these algorithms just don't work for you know people of color and don't work for women as well as they do for, for white men. And I was recently talking to the head of Microsoft Research and she was like, I cannot believe she was on your show. She totally got us in trouble. But now they are they've gone back and they're trying to retrain all of their algorithms and they, they're being intentional about it. And you know, look, look like it's 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 a step in the right direction. Um, but we don't want all these biases rewritten into the technology of the future. I mean tech is only going to become more powerful. Yeah. Um, but if we can get to Mars and build self-driving cars, like I think we can do this too. Yeah. The the question I have though is, you know, finding this kind of inequity can be exhausting, right? And so you talk about the, the researcher who really has fought against the Lena photo. And people kind of look to her to see if she's gonna have a reaction anytime, you know, if it's 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 um it's brought to the fore and she gets kind of tired of this, you know, she's she's sort of tired of fighting that fight. And you talk about how it can be exhausting and the emotional labor that white men do not have to perform. And you write, instead they can use that energy to focus on being a great engineer. Women and minorities, on the other hand, start and end the day at an emotional deficit. It is this death by a thousand cuts phenomenon that wears women down, not because they are weak or because they can't keep up, but because they are doing a whole other job. And, you know, as much such an uplifting <laughs> <laughs> But we can, you know, this, this book is obviously so centered on gender. And you know that with a, with, a, with a scope like this, you couldn't really get too much into sort of racial inequality. But I'm wondering if you could maybe just sort of share with us some of the insights that you gleaned as you were doing this research that maybe underscored more on the on the racial equity side that you couldn't maybe insert into a book with a scope. Right. So I think racism in tech is a whole other book. Ageism is underreported. I do address racism and sexuality and ageism to a, to a, to a certain extent, but um, you know I think there's so much more to be done. And if you look at the representation of blacks and Latinas in Silicon Valley, I mean it's it's downright depressing. Um, what's interesting after after Susan Fowler, the engineer at Uber, wrote that blog post that went viral, which is you don't know who she is. Um, on her first day on the job, she was propositioned for sex by her male manager over the company chat system. <laughs> and um, she took screenshots of it and thought, open and shut, brought it to HR, and they said, oh, we're going to let that slide because he's actually a really good engineer. Um, and so 
she decided to go public and it actually catalyzed a chain of events that led to Travis Kalanick, the CEO, then it ousted and then we've all been talking. Um, three weeks after her post, I had 12 women engineers over at my house for dinner. And this is something that I think all women can relate to. Um, they were not surprised at all because they are the only woman in the room over and over again. And so there are the more egregious examples of sexual harassment and getting proposition and being asked to go to a strip club, which happens. Um, but really, the bigger problem is this sort of emotional labor that you don't get credit for, that a lot of women do in many different kinds of organizations. And for them, when they're the only woman in the room, hour after hour after hour, there's also this sort of having to prove yourself again and having to prove why you're there and people sort of expect you to be exceptional because you're the only. Um, and I talk a little bit about how, the, you know, in this group of women there were, you know, black women, Latino women, women who didn't go to college, you know, one transgender woman, a lesbian woman, of, you know, uh, women with kids, women without. Um, and we talk about how all of these things, you know, you could, you can be not just a minority, but a double minority or a triple minority, and then you can sort of double or triple the, the, how exhausting this is for you. Um, you know, there was one African American woman who has worked at Salesforce for a couple of decades. So she, I mean, she was like a unicorn in the '80s when she was working at Oracle, Oracle as a black woman in tech. Um, and she talked about how the day after the election, everyone comes into the office and all the white women are crying. Can't believe Trump's been elected. So when like three months before, three black teenagers had been shot in a week. And she came to the office and she wanted to cry, but she felt like she couldn't. And people were all over like, you know, walking around the office smiling, and she's like, Don't you understand what's happening? Like, how can people be so upbeat? And so she went into a bathroom stall and cried by herself. And so, I mean, it's a perfect example of how we all have these sort of identities that are kind of our own ball and chain that we can't escape from, but people don't necessarily understand. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a woman who, you know, she's Latina, her parents were janitors, she, you know, commutes an hour and a half to work every day. She was actually an emergency services coordinator, coordinator who did training mid-career and then became an engineer. And she's like, I go to work and I feel like people don't even see me. Um, and I think those are sentiments that I think a lot of minorities can feel. Um, but, you know, it, it, it is just so important to create this sort of greater awareness about where we're all coming from. And if you can't be yourself, then why it's not certainly not worth being there at all. Um, Cheryl Sandberg has this whole bring your whole self to work thing. And I think that is really important. Like we have to think about workers as human beings and you know, maybe they want to talk about their personal lives. Maybe they don't, that's totally okay. But we have to, uh, we have to make sure that they sort of feel comfortable being themselves. Yeah. All right. Final question before we open it up to the rest of the group. Um, you mentioned the Susan Fowler uh, blog post, and um, it's interesting because it, it brings up this bystander problem, right? It was on a company chat platform. There are a lot of witnesses to, to that kind of violation. And you also talk about it in terms of um, the <coughs> solution section where you talk about the League of Legends mm -hmm. game, where um, what's interesting is that like the people who are sort of um, that you're Persistently negative, we're actually not the core problem of the negativity and the kind of violations through the chat platform, but it's actually the folks who would randomly kind of insert a comment that was that was wrong and it would sort of snowball into something else. Can we talk about the bystander problem that you know, you know within this book and, and what do we do to interrupt it? Right? The people in the Me Too movement kind of talk about the need for interrupters, like people to stop the violence speak up to say something. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that and what role maybe education has played? Yeah. So the League of Legends uh, is an example of how they actually changed the rules and they were able to change behavior. And it's a perfect example of how it's not just sort of the dark side of human nature that leads to all of these nasty things being said in these, in these online games, but actually if you change the rules, you can not only encourage positive behavior, but decrease negative behavior genre. Um, you just have to be, as a company, willing to make those decisions. Um, you know, so as you said, I wrote this before Me Too, before Trump. I mean, it, I could never have expected the cultural moment that we find ourselves in now. Um, and so, you know, 
I really benefited from women over the course of even my own reporting finding their collective courage when two years ago they were like, absolutely not, I'm not going on the record. And, you know, in the middle of last year, suddenly they're changing their minds and, you know, I'm just like, I'm so overwhelmed and my editor's like, we need your book tomorrow. I'm like, no, but it's happening now. <laughs> um, um, and so I, 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 I feel so lucky to be riding this wave. Um, and women speaking up has been so valuable. Great journalism and telling those stories has been so valuable. But it's not all on women, you know? I do think women need to continue to speak up to be part of the change, but we all men and women need to do this together. Um, and so advocacy and mentorship is so important. And when you see, if you see like, bad things happening, for example, if you see someone getting interrupted or getting mansplained or whatever's splained or not getting an opportunity, speak up for that person. It can be so much harder if you're the victim, quote unquote, to say, hi, I'm being mansplained, can you stop doing that? But if you, if you see it happening to someone, you can say like, Hey, so um, like that's um, and also we all in this room we have some amount of power and we have like an obligation to pass that power on, whether that's to you know to people with high potential, men and women. And I've benefited from great mentorship in my career from men and women. Um, and I've also had to be like squeaky and ask for help. Um, but you know, there's we all have a role to play, and I do think you know even it sounds sounds so basic, but like listening, asking, you know, how are you? These things are really, really important. And actually, I think millennials are increasingly demanding, when we talk a little bit about the sort of sense of entitlement, which I think is sort of valley has gone, gone to the extreme. But in general, like, millennials, they want, like, they, they think they deserve, like, a pretty good place to work. And so they're going to be asking you these questions, and if they're not happy, they're going to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is a war for talent. Um, to your question about education, you know, as I've argued, the tech industry created the pipeline problem. They are reinforcing the pipeline problem to this day. And I interview uh, seven teenage girls at the end of the book who all learned how to code, and they're so excited. They're so excited to do their part to change the world, but they're scared because they read the news. And they, you know, one of them was like, I know these women in tech groups on Facebook, and they talk about me being mansplained, and you know, there's not a lot of people like Cheryl Sandberg. And then I heard that Travis Kalanick was meditating in the lactation room at Uber? Like, what's that about? Um, and I honestly was surprised at how much they knew. But they pick up these signals, um, and they can't be what they can't see. Um, and so the tech industry can't sit there and say, like, oh, it's a pipeline, but it's all on the universities, or all on parents, or all on you know, coding camps in fourth grade. Um, they could be doing so much more. Yes, there's so much our education system can be doing, which again is a whole nother book. There's so much, you know, there's stuff we can all do as parents and, and, and as role models, but um, you know, Google has, has thrown sort of tens of millions of dollars into them. Tens of millions of dollars in the pipeline. But they've invested $30 billion in their cloud business. So when you talk about just how much they care, I mean they're just sort of like so it's such a disproportionate amount of effort going into rocket ships and flying cars than there is in, into creating a diverse workforce that you know we really want to unlock the true and full potential of. And we won't be able to do that for our girls and for our boys if, if we don't make a change. Mm -hmm. And um, you know I fully realize that you like this is a this is a group of people who work in different industries and you all have your bro problem as we were discussing um, and sexism and sexual harassment exists everywhere. And this needs to be addressed everywhere. But I do think what's, what makes Silicon Valley a little different is that the people in Silicon Valley report to be changing the world. And in so many ways they have. But in one huge way, they're actually really behind. Um, and I think this sort of, you know, the amount of wealth and power that's been created in such a short period of time has led to a sense of arrogance and entitlement and wall exceptionalism that has like has been become an impediment to solving the problem where people are saying like oh my gosh we've done such amazing things how can you say we're part of the problem and so like, it's time to admit that and really do some dramatic things to make a difference yeah. what's been kind of the feedback from the book yeah 
Um, um, I feel like the feedback has been like 90 to 95 percent positive. That's what I see, and I realize this is a salt of too many people are in this room. Um, you know, I've certainly had some unhappy people, um, and I don't take that lightly because, like, my day job depends on having relationships with people who want to come on the show. And so, at the beginning of this, I, you know. I told my editor, I was like, I'm not, this is not going to be like TMZ for Silicon Valley. I'm not going to try to burn Silicon Valley down. I actually want to do something constructive that will make a difference. Um, and it sort of goes against every bone in my body as a journalist for, you know, 15 years to, to take a stand. You know, I've been trained to be objective and not have an opinion. And the book, like, takes a strong stand. It's called Rotopia. Um, but it is very data-driven and, and Driven, and so I feel like it's backed up. Um, and I, I, I sort of know that no good change comes without some people feeling a little uncomfortable. And so I'm willing to, willing to deal with that. Had a few mean tweets. My mom tries. My mom has tried to school some of the Twitter trolls. <laughs> really amazing. I was like, see, like, notifications pop up like, Sandy checks. And I'm like, oh my god, mom, stop. <laughs> Is there a worry at all that we'll swim too far on certain things and then the court of public opinion will dictate outcomes versus the process? Right. And are we in that potentially swimming too far? So I totally understand, and there's you know new data that's been collected that men are now more scared to mentor women and more scared to work with women. And you know, honestly, at first I was kind of like, really? Like I I I sort of had this reaction of, you know where the line is. Know where the line is, um, but then I was talking to plenty of good people, who, including my own husband, who, and I was like, like, do you, like, is this really? Do you really not know what to do? And he was like, you know, I think so. a lot of people are kind of like, well, am I allowed to hug? Am I allowed to say that's a nice dress? Like, what, like, where, like, where is the line? Um, and so I understand that, and so I just think having these conversations is important. Of course, there's a risk of the pendulum swinging too far, but like it's been so far in the other direction for so long. And so in my view, it's kind of, it's about time. And even though many, many people have been exposed for the most sort of egregious forms of behavior, um, I have a pile of tips on my desk about other people that will, like stories that will never be told. Because those stories about particular individuals are really, really to the core. And, you know, I did, one that took six months, and it was you know, all of these legal issues. Like when you're taking on someone's career, like that's a big, someone's life, like that's a big calculation. And so, you know, there there are so many, there are so many more bad behaviors that, that need to be rooted out. But I think the wake up call is is really important. And until you know a woman engineer or a woman CEO or a woman directing a Hollywood movie or a woman running for president or being president is normal, then I think. We're going to continue having this conversation. And I won't call it a success until we get there. I was so struck when you said uh, how they didn't want to lower their standards <laughs> to I mean, remember for the higher women or for the venture capital. And this is something that comes up all the time in academia, especially if you're looking for senior women to hire. Um, if you want a dean or you, know, you want a full professor, you want to hire a woman this, you want to hear a woman political scientist? It's as if there are like four of them and they're already employed and you can't get them, you know. Um, and when I just think about how this all plays out and, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious to know more about the HR practices to think about if you are going to, how do we get this perception that these are the only ones and it's relying on all of these shortcuts um, about, you know, where you got your PhD, or which journals, or people like really not evaluating the work themselves, or evaluating the record, but going on the shortcuts and going on the networks, because this idea that if you just opened it up, like, well, how could you possibly evaluate everyone's record in the whole world? That would be an impossible task, and so we need to use these shortcuts. So, when these places try to open it up, do they devote a lot more resources to screening, or do they somehow totally manage it? 
Yeah, so I mean, look, it's a mixed bag. Um, you know, if you just focus on raising awareness about bias and everyone's doing unconscious bias training right now, it's not necessarily going to have a huge impact. You have to have it. It's really hard to say, just change the way you think about women. Um, you really have to give people the tools to combat bias. And so that might be not even starting an interview process until you have two people of color and two female candidates. And then you, you can pick the best one, but you look, you have to look a little harder for those people. Um, you standardize the interview questions. So if you just sort of do an interview ad hoc, off, you know, often the questions, if you think someone sort of looks apart, the question will be different than if you think someone doesn't look apart. And so they might perform completely differently when in fact it was the interview that was different and the, the standards that were unfair. Um, you also have to you know, structure, restructure, and standardize the review and feedback systems because the way that feedback is delivered when you already have the job, and people are evaluated is completely different. And this is not an academia example, but I was speaking to a young woman in the air force yesterday who they stat rank all of the, the squad captains and show the rankings to people. And three months ago, she was number two, and now she's number 22. And she was like, what changed? And said, well, you're pregnant. You can't be deployed. And she was like, are you kidding? You're saying this to me in the middle of 2018? And not actually just saying it to me. You're saying it to everyone. Um, and so there are like ridiculous things like that which happen. Um, you know, that said, if you, if you give them all these tools, I think there's still this sort of risk of tokenism and people who are the only or one of few feeling like, well, I'm only here because I'm a woman. And other people thinking, well, they're only here because they're, they're a woman. Um, and I was asked this question at the University of Washington by a young um, African-American woman, and she was like, I just like, feel like I'm getting all these opportunities because I'm black, and I don't, I don't even know if I should take them. And in my view, um, I actually got my start in journalism as part of a diversity program. And I didn't, long story, but I didn't even realize when I was applying that it was, it was a diversity program. And when I found out, it was kind of like a dagger, like, oh, that's why I'm here. Um, but you know what? I'm so glad I had that opportunity. And what I told her is take those opportunities and then kick ass and prove to everyone that you deserve to be there, not because of your gender or your color, but because you're really good. And so, um, you know, there's so much that, and I think that so many HR systems are broken and they're really protecting companies, they're not protecting employees. Um, but I do think it's a matter of thinking about what are the tools that we want to give ourselves and our employees to try to combat some of these things. So I'm just curious about like, the public policy. You know, when I think of equal pay, family equity, there's case law that goes back decades of women suing for rights. And what is public policy for what is public policy play a role in shaping the field? It already has to some degree. Silver Valley in particular is not unique in its desire as an industry to push back against government encroachment in these ways, but it, it feels to me like no one ever gives up power. And this the the gender is a manifestation of you know what? I have power right now, and that's some gender is a manifestation of that, but white men going like this mm -hmm. is, well, right now I have power. Mm -hmm. And anything you suggest diminishes that power. Anything you suggest diminishes that power. And change like that tends to take civil rights movement, women's movement, case law that follows it in generations. Like, what's the role of that type of thing in this particular context? Yeah. No, I, I've gotten asked that question. Oh, should we legislate diversity? Um, should we have quotas? I mean, I don't like love the idea of quotas. I wish that we could do this on our own, but we haven't been able to. Um, and in in Europe, where they do have quotas in some countries, actually, they are changing the ratios and moving the needle. And even the quotas in certain countries, where they, you know, if you're a neighboring country and you don't have a quota, it's actually putting pressure on that country to 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 bring up the numbers. Um, you know, and there's there's you know, this, there's amazing study by the IMF that found that focus on Nordic countries. If you replace a, a man with a woman on a board or an executive team, profitability goes up by by three to eight percent. Shocker. But if you actually if you sort of over rotate and you have sixty percent women, you start having diminishing returns. So actually, it's that <coughs> that balance is really important. Um, you know, I don't know about quotas, but maybe there should be some sort of legislation around 
who you're who you're who you're interviewing and make sure that perhaps requiring that you do the interview with the first slate of candidates. But companies, you're right, aren't necessarily going to do this on their own. Amazon, there was recently a shareholder proposal at Amazon where you know Jeff Bezos has ten direct reports, they're all men, one all white, all men, one woman. Um, and then seventy percent of their board is male. And there was a shareholder proposal asking that they implement the Rooney rule when looking for new directors. So interviewing different candidates um, for every job. And Amazon reflexively pushed back because as you said, you know, companies just they reject everything. Um, and there was um, kind of an employee revolt. And three days later, Amazon said, okay, we'll, we'll do it. Um, and so I do think it's not just you know, public policy is one thing, but I think it's, it's, it's consumers and actually employees that have a lot of power to make a difference. And certainly sort of finding that voice is gonna, is, is gonna be hard. But I do think that's something that gets listened to. But just on that topic, what, um, what do you think the media can in order to change the perception that you're you're good anyway and you're proving yourself, despite the fact that you're a minority or a woman, you're good anyway, and shift it to the fact that diversity is an end in and of itself for reasons beyond diversity. And I say that, for instance, uh, I run the automation and technology program in America, and we did a day where we brought in a bunch of different technologies so that people could test them out and look at them. And one of the things that was there was an augmented reality thing that turned any flat surface into a touch screen. And when I tried to test it by using my finger, it didn't work. And the founders were there, they freaked out. Why, why isn't it working? Why isn't it working? Why isn't it working? And they tried it and it did work. And it turns out that all of the founders were men and they had never tested it on a fingernail this size. And so <laughs> just for the sake of having had a woman in the room, the outcome would have been different. Regardless of whether the woman had been an engineer or good or whatever the thing is. And so when I hear that like you shouldn't have diversity just for the sake of diversity, I think there are real arguments that you should just for the sake of diversity, in addition to all the other reasons. And how do you get that view out there in the public framework? Well, I think the media has a huge role to play in, you know, and, and good and bad. I mean, we've seen, as I said, some incredible journalism from various organizations to expose some, some of this bad behavior, but the media is also equally guilty of glorifying, you know, the you know the the, the, the lone sort of male genius entrepreneur um, who's trying to get us to Mars. I'm not talking about anyone in particular. Um, <laughs> and there's a, a, there's a section in my book where I talk about Cheryl Sandberg and Marissa Meyer and how the media just like disproportionately a covers them and b covers them in a negative way, you know on topics that are just not covered when it comes to men. So the length of Marissa Meyer's maternity leave became an international event. Like if she was a man who was about to have a child, no one would have, would have even known. And there was a column in USA Today that said, Cheryl Sandberg and Marissa Meyer, are they sending back the cause of working moms? And I was just like, why would you even publish this? Like, come on. And so yes, we do have a responsibility. And I mean, I'm certainly trying to do my small part. Bloomberg, we're not. Saints, but um, we have this amazing project right now called the Women's Voices Project, where we are we're actually being asked to count the number of women who are on our shows and voted in our stories, and we're doing outreach training programs for up and coming female executives to get them to be and, and media ready. Um, and when we actually when we speak, we get a lot of invitations to speak at conferences, and if there's no women on the panel, we're supposed to say, "I can't do it unless you." And so, like that's one small way. We're, we're doing our part, but so much of it is just about sort of the cultural perception of what what one men and women can accomplish. And I completely agree with you. You know, there's plenty of examples in the book. Um, Dick Costello, who was the CEO of Twitter for a time, when he started his second company, was very vigilant about who wasn't going to hire a man and who hired a woman because he's like, in the room, we can move faster. We don't have to. We can just say, like, what do you think of this feature? We don't have to like go down to the street and do user research to ask women what they think. Um, and I, I do want to mention that I was talking to you about this, this earlier is that if you look at companies that are run by women, the few bigger tech companies like Stitch Fix and Eventbrite and Red the Runway that are run by women, they're actually 50 50. So just having women in leadership roles leads to more women in leadership roles. And these things feed on themselves, and people want to work at places where they're not going to be the only. 
So first, thanks for taking the stand. Uh, I haven't read the book yet, but I will. Uh, my organization invests uh, in different companies. It's, it has been difficult to find women-like businesses, especially in venture, uh, for that. On the flip side, um, the idea that having women as part of your board, I've seen it firsthand, uh, and how it elevates the performance of the board. Uh, overseas in Iraq, I saw it firsthand. Uh, hard to get us to peace there until I had three women that joined the city council and empowered them, and it worked for excellent because they looked at things through a different lens. Um, that said, how do you raise young ladies today? I've got three daughters, and I see part of the solution is if you're a leader, you have to lead regardless of your organization. Right? So take a stand and start moving these initiatives forward, forward regardless of policy, legislation, quotas. Um, but I find it really difficult with my daughters because the peer pressure society in general is, is hard for them. So what advice do you have on that front? Um, I tell them you got to work twice as hard to get half the credit. That's just the way the world works. So, you know, suck it up, you know, <laughs> and they're like... But hopefully my three boys will make it different for you. Um, I hear all the time, you know, I have daughters, I want this for them, I'm like, we need this for our girls, and we do. I want this for my sons too, you know, I think their lives will be better in a more equal world. Um, and when it comes to parenting, like, I, like, just like you, I'm like, can you tell me your advice? Like, how do I do this? Um, you know, honestly, I'm very, very conscious of these issues, and especially, um, you know, I, I see how one small input can have such a huge impact on them. Um, and, you know, in general, for me, just as a working mom, like, even though, you know, I've been on tour the last several months, and it's been hard, and leaving, and I want to cry, like, when I say goodbye to them, but, like, I leave with this brave face because I want them to know that my work is valuable and mommy works and that's important and I'm doing something that makes a difference and they both have the book on their nightstands. Uh, and we've talked a lot about how they're not allowed to read it until they're 21 and <laughs> adults books are a lot longer than kids' books. Um, but in general, like, the, I want them to know that they can do and be whatever they want and that anyone, any girl can do and be whatever they want. Girls can be superheroes, pink can be a boy's color. You know, it sounds small, but, you know, they can be really impacted by these really tiny, tiny little pieces of information. And so, so certainly it's about surrounding them with good people and making sure that they're in a good environment. Um, some children's books are so bad on gender role stereotyping, and I'll, like, change the characters, change the gender of the characters in the book. My, my older son is starting to see people like, Mom, you're, like, reading the wrong thing. And I'm like, but you know that. Women can be scientists, too, right? <laughs> And daddy can do the laundry, and daddy should do the laundry. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's things like that. I mean, if you have daughters, like, ex if, and expose them to this. Like, they should at least have the chance. Um, and make sure, like, ask them questions about how it's going, and make sure it feels like an environment that they're comfortable with. Because there are a lot of different ways now to learn how to code. Um, and, you know, maybe a certain way or a certain coding camp isn't working for them, but something else can. So. But I want your parenting advice. <laughs> 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 um, Emily, I know you spoke okay. at the wing last night, the women's um, only co-working space in DC. How do you feel if that's harmful or helpful? To this yeah, place? you know, it's interesting. Um, I actually thought about that. Like, should I be speaking here? Um, in my view, there have been male-only spaces for so long, so why not? Um, and I do think it can be. So, you know, I often actually, if people, like, when I get into to speak, I actually urge them to have a, a diverse audience. Like, I don't want to speak only to women. I want everyone to hear this message. But at the same time, I do see some value in, in women being able to have these conversations among themselves. Um, it's a private organization, so I guess they can make their own rules, but they're actually being challenged in the state of New York as to whether this is even, even legal. Um, I went to Harvard University, where we have a long history of finals clubs, and then they were, they were all male, and, and women started doing their own organizations, and now Harvard is saying, you can't do this, or you're going to lose certain privileges at the university if you have a single sex organization. So these are, like, I don't have the answer. These are questions that <coughs> institutions are dealing with. I mean, in general, I just think we've had some male-only spaces for so long that maybe women should have the opportunity to have some sort of, some sort of female networking. Um, and we'll see how that one plays out. I don't know. Do we think that's bad? Do we think that the... 
Yeah. <laughs> if we're trying to be inclusive and you know having everyone share their ideas. I also spoke at an incubator in Seattle called. Um, well, I keep thinking she work, but it's she work is the river. The river. Um, and they do. They they are like a female focused cohort. Or they they make sure that they have their supportive environment and supportive of women, but they take men. So they have a very strong opinion that the name is not is not the right structure. Um, and I think their membership is like one percent men. Maybe that's a, a, a different solution. Can you talk a little bit more about your observation that um, young women? Are viewed as unqualified and young men are go getters. That's something I've certainly experienced. And I'm interested to hear if you can sort of unpack that some more, understand the origins of that perception by employers, the public, funders. So there uh, is an amazing article in the Harvard Business Review that came out a couple months ago about how men and women are far more similar than different. Like just as ambitious, just as willing to take risks, but any differences that you see anecdotally or in Real life are the result of socialization and a result of how opportunity is told out and a result of stereotypes and expectations. Um, and so it's very unfortunate, um, but it's, you know, it goes back decades and centuries of, of, of thinking that, you know, women, women work at home and, 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 and men work at work. And I do think, in general, some, a lot of this isn't going to change until work at home is also shared equally. Like, work, we want work at work to be shared equally, we need work at home. Um, if you want to get we need work at home to be shared equally as well. What's interesting about the data that I shared about how investors perceive male and female entrepreneurs differently, and by the way, so many women were, were told in pitch meetings, like there's this fixation on whether they're having children or how many children they're going to have and how they're going to do it, which men do not in the past. And you will have, you know, I'll have husband and wife on these meetings who know what the other is being asked, and you know, the husband who has three kids like never comes up. Never comes up. But what's interesting is that men and women both have those biases about men and women entrepreneurs. And so male and female investors have the same sort of tendencies to think that men can do it and women follow us. That's likely a little bit deeper here. So it's actually pretty fascinating. Again, we all have our own biases and we all need to look at. So following up on that, those biases, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about venture capital and their role. I think you had to play like a five point policy technology, and I'm not sure that. Spills over to venture capital. I mean, there would have been financial services for a long time. You've had an expanding pipeline. A lot of them have not listed them in the boards majors. So, but they're still heavily male dominated. And, and so, do you have any specific explanations for that? And then, how does that feed into the funding sources and the technology also kind of feeding them into this male dominance? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it goes back to that discussion of power. And so, yeah. a lot of these men have a lot of money. Um, and they've been in power for a very long period of time, and to them it's working just fine. Well, we found next, we found Facebook, we found Google. Um, how could we be possibly doing anything wrong? And of course, I like to think, well, what about all the women that never got a chance to start with Facebook or Apple? Um, and you know, as we've discussed, I think the standards are different for, 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 for men and women. And the problem, part of the problem is also the investors who are called limited partners who invest in venture capital funds. They're just looking for the best returns. And unfortunately, there's just not, you know, many of these women who are now going out to start their own funds just don't have time. They're like, well, we're not, we don't invest unless they have 5X. Well, how can anyone have 5X if they're just starting out? Um, I've seen some movement in the LP community to do more sort of impact investing in investing diversity. I, I did an interview with Melinda Gates, who's now making this like her thing. And she, in, she, she so she's an LP. Uh, who's, who's, who's now investing in, she's focused on getting more women into tech and venture capital, and so she recently backed a fund called Aspect Ventures, which is, which is founded by two women, but she is definitely an outlier. Um, but her thing is, look, I think this is a competitive advantage. And there are some people who do believe, and that is their thesis, this is a competitive advantage, investing in diverse teams is a competitive advantage, but it is going to take some years to have the data play out for some people who are skeptical. Um, you know, to the point about how do we find women partners and to join our firms, you know, I completely agree with you. The pipeline is expanding. There are so many people out there with potential, and if we think potential has been untapped, then, you know, someone who might be, you know, at, on a, at a lower rung on the ladder could actually, you know, flourish in, in a role if, if given this opportunity. 
and I was I was speaking with the CEO who was like, you know, I totally understand what you're doing. And like, we really wanted to get such and such woman, high ranking woman at this tech company on our board, but I mean, she had like five other offers, so she didn't pick us. I was like, well, she's not the only one. <laughs> but, and I was in love. I was like, why don't you just ask her? She probably has like ten different people that she could be. And so, you know, we all have our own networks, and it's just about going a step further and asking those questions. And I actually, I ran into her, and I was like, so I told them to ask you for your. She's like, I have like twenty five people, <laughs> and they would all be great. I was just curious. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you. Silicon Valley, yeah. not bro. Thank you for being So I was curious about um, last year. So I, I look at that whenever I invest in a company or you're just talking to a company because it's a it flawed though it may be, it's a yes. view into how employees view leadership or view the company. And it, it seems like it has a potentially powerful role here if there were sort of a lens, and maybe there is, but I'm not aware of it, that's sort of a view of the company through women's eyes and others as well. Um, so I wonder if you could talk to them in the course of this. Yeah, um, I have not talked to them specifically, but I am aware of their data, and they've actually done some really interesting research on pay equity, which in, in Silicon Valley, the pay gap is five times the national average. So for an industry that loves data, it's sort of like, in my view, like just paying people fairly is like the easiest thing to do. But I do think that there is, and this goes back to the point about how employees can be really a motivation for change, is ask people questions, survey their employees, and maybe if they're, I think they do break some stuff out by gender because uh, when I did this Amazon H2 story, I was really interested in how it is if men and women were rating companies differently. Um, and what they ended up giving us, and I can't remember if this is because they didn't have that data, is that they found that um, far more women than men apply to Amazon, and <coughs> even more than apply to, the, the ratio is even higher at Amazon than Google and so Google, Facebook, not perfect, as we all know, but Amazon is even, even worse in terms of sort of the perception of it as a place that is better for men than women. But I certainly think that, I know, you know, Glassdoor, some people don't like it because it is imperfect, and yet these giant conclusions are drawn from like a very limited set of data. Um, but I actually think that there could be some, you should pitch it. That's yeah. interesting idea. Is that a thing? Like a census of index? Or a um, index? Yeah. Like, wow. Like, I'm reading of like all of these ideas. You know, like that's, that's actually something great. Oh. That's the first thing. Like, you know? if they had some, you know, toggle or something where you could actually say, or show me this evaluation from that perspective yeah. of women employees. Then there's an ongoing way to track whether they're moving or they're. Yeah. That's fascinating. There is actually there is a great idea. Site. There's a thing called edge certification. Are you familiar with that? I don't know. It's like lead for buildings, you know, a green building edge certification goes through a corporation and gives you a certification on how you're doing in terms of gender equality. So our organization is going to be the first U.S. government organization to go through it. Hopefully, kind of set a standard at least at the U.S.G. level. Mm -hmm. But it's a I think it will be a really interesting tool to see how do those companies perform once right. they have that certification compared to their peers. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's awesome. I think there is a website that's trying to be the last floor or just a current gender issue, but the problem is like it's its own thing. Yes. It's inappropriate to the right of the area of the other information. I think we have time for one last question. Oh, great. <laughs> um, you've said a number of times that's a whole other book or yeah. that's a whole separate issue. Not that it's your time to write an announcement. <laughs> yeah. But what do you think is the next? Untold story in Silicon Valley or the tech industry, or not even to limit it to that. But when you think about these things, and this is getting so much coverage, and there's the Me Too, it, what's the next thing that exists and that everybody knows about and that no one's talking about? Yeah. Um, so the book could have been so many things. It could have been like 12 stories of amazing women who practice in Hong Kong. Um, but when I started doing my research, I just realized there's so much we don't understand about what we're doing wrong that we just can't fix it unless we understand that. Um, that said, like I've been thinking a lot about what is utopia? Like where are things working? Who's doing things that are right? And it's it's not easy to find those examples, which is why I think maybe that could be another book, but they are out there and there are places that, that, that people work with and say, actually my boss is me. Like I I am always like, what did they what does he or she do? Like how does this how does this happen? Um, and I, I'm thinking about sort of what is utopia but across industry. So not only in Silicon Valley, but everywhere. Like, why, why did Black Panther succeed? Why did Black Panther succeed? And why did it take so long? I mean, I think there's just so many different 
lesson there. And, 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 and everyone, when I go into these, these places to speak, like they all want to know what they can do. They all want to know what they can do better. And, you know, we can't like fast forward, but, you know, people are sort of hungry for positive information. And I, I, I don't, I can't do this again. I have PTSD. Um, so, I, if you guys, if anyone in here has uh, good examples that they want to share, please tell me about them. Thank you so much, Emily. Thanks, everyone.